Good morning. Welcome to God's house for our worship today. In your pew, you'll find that little black booklet. Looks kind of like this one. They're all the same. Please fill that out. Pass it along to those who are next to you in the pew if there is somebody there. The order of service that we're going to use today is printed for you in the service folder that you received when you came into God's house today. We also celebrate our Lord's Supper today, so those who are communing, please do be sure to take the communicant card off in the back, the pew in front of you in the little rack. Fill that out and you can give it to the usher when you come to the Lord's table. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 81. In the hymn that we join to sing, Arise and Shine in Splendor. with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil that I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, 
God made us alive in Christ Jesus even when we were dead in our sins. So hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. You sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. God speaks to our hearts in his word. Our first reading from the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a faint spirit. 
so that they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord to display his beauty. Then they will rebuild ancient ruins. They will raise up what was formerly devastated and they will renew ruined cities which have been, de which have been devastated for generations. Strangers will stand and shepherd your flock and foreigners will be your farmers and vine dressers. You will be called the Lord's priests. You will be named ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and you will boast about their riches. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm is Psalm 19 and we'll sing the verses responsibly. Second reading from Acts chapter 4. After Peter and John were released, they went to their own friends and reported everything the high priest and the elders had said. When they heard this, with one mind they raised their voices to God and said, Master, you are the God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. By the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, you said, Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed one. For certainly in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and people of Israel, were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did whatever your hand and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. O Lord, look at their threats. 
and give to your servants the ability to keep on speaking your word with all boldness. As you stretch out your hand to heal, and as signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken. Also, everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. Glory be to you, O Lord. Also the sermon text for the week. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding area. He was teaching in their synagogues and being honored by everyone. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set, those who are, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, then he began to tell them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. The next hymn is hymn number 85 in the hymnal, O God from God, O Light from Light.
may the words that I speak and all the thoughts of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now that it's been a few years since I have completely moved out of Michigan and only returned there once, maybe twice a year, I have found myself, when I go back, driving around the old stomping grounds and no doubt becoming more and more annoying to my wife and my children as I point out the various uh, places of importance throughout Bay City, Michigan. Like, that's where Daddy did that. And I used to play ball over there. And that's where I picked radishes for eight hours a day. Like, that's something important. For some of the communities and the places which we called home have extreme importance to us. For others, we're not quite so sentimental. For some, however, home may be the place of quite unpleasant memories and the place that all I wanted to do was get away from. I'm also thinking about when the hero comes home or when the unit that's deployed finally is back stateside again or the ship that's been sailing returns. You want to, get, you want to see me cry? Let's just sit down and watch some of those videos where the service members surprise their children at school or at the baseball game and those reactions. Whenever the team wins the championship, whether it's the Lombardi or the World Series or Lord Stanley, there's always a parade to welcome back the champions. But today Jesus comes home to Nazareth. And things are quite different than when Jesus had left Nazareth. He had left the son of the carpenter, the son of Mary, and now he returns, you heard it, as the most popular show in the whole region of Galilee. More people were talking about Jesus than as are talking about politics today, if you can imagine that. And now he comes home. And as he comes home, what happens? There's no parade. There's no party. There's no cruising around the old stomping grounds. Jesus goes to church. And as Jesus goes to church today, we have the opportunity again, this epiphany, to learn to hear the same things that we have heard so far these weeks as our Lord has been revealed to us. Here at church, it is clear who Jesus is again and what Jesus has come to do. But it is different how that is told to us. So let's think about how it's been told to us so far, this epiphany. The Magi came from a long ways away. We came along with them along with all the nations that Jesus has come to be the Savior of and worshipped Him as the Savior for all people. It was clear who Jesus was and what He's come to do. And then, then we were with Him in the waters of the Jordan River. And there we saw the anointing and the designation for this special job that we hear about in our lessons here today that Jesus speaks about. Not only that, we hear a voice thundering from heaven which, which tells us exactly who Jesus is. This is my son that I love. And the Holy Spirit's even there too, making all this very clear of who Jesus is. And last week, we, we went to the wedding. We went to that wedding where Jesus performed that first miracle, that miraculous sign, which we learned pointed out that Jesus was true God. But now today we again see exactly who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. But now how is it revealed to us this time? There's no magi, no voice from heaven, no wonder spirit. How? Words. On a scroll. Words that were proclaimed by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61, 700 years before Jesus set foot in the synagogue in, the Nazareth, in the synagogue in Nazareth on that day. That's all it is, words. 
words with which Jesus shows us who he is and what he's come to do for us. And giving him, as we see it, the very first opportunity for his mouth to proclaim, admit, just who he is. He chooses this verse of Isaiah the prophet for a very special reason. You almost got that sense. The scroll is handed to him. He unrolled it and he's looking. Where's that passage? That passage is right there. That's the one. That's the one I need to use today. Because this message, being fulfilled, is so clear. It cannot be mistaken. And it must be clear. And it must not be mistaken because of those that were in church with Jesus that day. Who were they? Those in church with Jesus that day are, of course, the people of Nazareth. The church was maybe packed a little bit more than what it usually was because maybe they were hoping Nazareth would actually get a dot on the map now that Jesus was there. They could be his hometown, right? But they were familiar with Jesus. They knew he was the son of the carpenter and that he had picked up on his father's occupation. He became a carpenter himself. They were familiar with Jesus. They knew who his mother was. They knew what street he lived on. They knew what games he liked to play, whether he was on that side of the road tracks or that side of the railroad tracks. They were familiar with Jesus, and Jesus knows exactly how familiar they are with him, which is why he must be absolutely clear to them who he really is. And so he unrolls the scroll of Isaiah. He reads the prophecy, puts it back, and says simply, Today, this is fulfilled. Today, this is exactly what Isaiah has said. What Jesus is saying clearly in the most simple way to these people who are so familiar with him is that he is not the one that they think he is but that he is the Messiah he is the one God has promised and this is an amazing declaration no doubt everybody packed in that synagogue that day they were Jews. They were waiting for Messiah. They wanted Messiah to come. And now God, he's kept his word to us. God has done what he promised he's going to do. There's been silence. No prophet has spoken for 500 years. And now all of this is what we're seeing. And now water's changing into wine. And the silence is shattered. You would have thought that upon hearing Jesus clearly tell them who he was, that the ovation and the shouting would have blown the roof off that old synagogue in Nazareth. What you've been waiting for has finally arrived. But that's not how it was. There was silence in church after Jesus so clearly showed who he was. Because these people are way too familiar with him. I've wondered, just because I'm in that position very often, obviously, what those faces look like as they were staring at Jesus in silence. He just told them that he was the Messiah, and they have known him all their lives. And I'm sure the look on their faces showed that gigantic question mark. We know that, that look, don't we? Because they knew who he was. And he certainly could not be who he said. Because that only just not doesn't make sense, it just simply cannot be because they were so familiar with Jesus and we see right there something for us don't we as we again get to hear today exactly who Jesus is it is a dangerous thing 
to become too familiar with Jesus. To know him too well in the sense that he can't be who he clearly said he's going to be. And who is in danger most of becoming too familiar with Jesus? So that the importance of who he is and what he's done is no longer significant. But of course those, those were in church. But Jesus knows this. Which is exactly why Jesus picks this out. So that it is completely clear who he is and what he's come to do. Now as he uses this prophecy from Isaiah, we have to remind ourselves that most of the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in two ways. They were fulfilled in history and they were fulfilled through God's Old Testament people. And so this one would have been fulfilled in that way too because God took his people back from Babylon and brought them back into the promised land. But these prophecies also are used by God to explain for us and to show us what he does to deliver us from our sin, for our salvation. Another example of this would be Passover. He brought the children of Israel out from Egypt, but that Passover lamb was a picture of what Jesus had to do to sacrifice himself for our sins. So as we are looking at this prophecy, we must remember that we are talking about spiritual things here. And as we learn who Jesus is and we take this to heart, we hear him especially say today to people that are so familiar with him, God has made me to do this. God has appointed me, not you, me for this work. And he has given this work to me because only, only I am the one who can do this. And what is he going to do? He is going to proclaim, to preach good news to those who are poor. Well, what, what does that mean that people are poor? Does that mean they don't have money? Are they homeless and, and jobless and they don't have food? No, remember, we're talking about spirituality here. So we are talking about the poverty of sin. He has come. He has come to rescue those who are under the poverty of sin. Now, what does that mean? Of course, if you're poor, you're without. And this is where we also see why Jesus picked out this passage. Because he picked out this passage in a way that also shows something that we are familiar with, don't we? How familiar are we, are we are with sin. How familiar we are with the poverty of sin. That in sin, we don't have what God demands. And in the poverty of our sin, as poverty often does, is it makes us helpless. Poverty becomes that cycle. I just can't get out of it. In the poverty of sin, I look and I'm, there's nothing I can do to change this situation for myself. Nothing whatsoever. Look at the other, other ways Jesus describes his work, huh? To bring sight to those who are blind, to bring freedom to those in captivity, relief to those who are under oppression. We know, we know, we know, because we're so familiar with the effects of sin in our lives. We know how sin blinds us, especially when trouble is striking our life. How sin blinds us to the goodness and the mercy of, of God our Savior. We know the captivity of sin as well. Quite familiar with it. How automatic that eye roll is from children when parents tell them to do something. No, you need to think about it. When I hear somebody talking about somebody else, how automatic it is from my two cents in. Got to get that in there. We know the captivity. It's so familiar how lust simply controls us. We look without even thinking. How greed causes us to say, well, if I just have more money, then life is going to be better. 
we're also quite familiar of how sin crushes us. It crushes us with its guilt. It crushes and destroys relationships that we have in our lives. We are very familiar with sin. And as such, and also being familiar with Jesus, we see again who he is and what he has come to do. He has come to make those who are poor in the poverty of sin have everything in God. To give sight to those who are blind, who cannot see God and who cannot find God, who do not see God as the God who loves. To those who are crushed and oppressed, bringing relief, and aid, comfort to those who are in captivity to set you free from sin's power. And how has he done this? Go back to what Jesus said. God has made me the one. Made me the one to do this. And exactly how did he do that? We know. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus made himself very familiar with us in our lives, didn't he? Just how familiar was Jesus with us? Well, where, do we, where are we today? And where is Jesus today? In the gospel. In church. How familiar did he become with our sin and with our lives? Well, he was familiar because God took all of our sin and put it on himself. How familiar is Jesus with our life? He was familiar with our sufferings, as the same prophet Isaiah told us about in chapter 53. So familiar with our sufferings. As he took on himself all of our sin, all of its guilt, all that crushes us. And let himself be crushed by all the wrath of hell on the cross. Oh, so familiar with us in our lives. Because he has taken our place to live and to die. To be the one that God has sent to bring us our salvation. In my two churches that I have served in my ministry, I always kept track of the number, the sermon number that, that I'm on, that I preached. I didn't do this when I was teaching at the college. I was still preaching those first two years. Nor have I kept complete track of the funeral sermons and things, services of that nature that I have, have preached for. I'm upward around 600 or so sermons. And that's just not the number of times I preach. That's sermons, because I preach some sermons three times a week, for example, like this weekend. Of all those sermons I preach, they finally all boil down to the sermon that Jesus preaches in church today. And his was much shorter than mine has been these past minutes. It was six words, surely, or certainly today this is fulfilled in your hearing. All the millions of words that my mouth has uttered, they finally are, are that simple sermon. Because God keeps his word. God keeps his word to you in Jesus. And thought of this overwhelms me. Because not only do those who come to church get to see Jesus, the preacher gets to see his Savior too. We know, both you and I, when we come to church, Jesus is there. 
because he says so. Jesus is there. In my words, in your words of confession, in the thoughts of our hearts, in our prayers, in our songs, in the sacraments, When we're at church, Jesus is there. Because today, Jesus goes to church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls you as faithful. He will do it. Amen. We join our hearts and our places together as one to confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ our Lord and for all according to their needs. Heavenly Father, as your chosen people, we ask that you grant us faith to know that Christ has come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that he has made us members of his body. We pray for your mercy then on all people and for ourselves. Almighty Father, we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we be granted faith so also to rejoice that the scriptures are fulfilled in our hearing as we come to your holy house. That we, like our Lord who is in the synagogue each Sabbath, make it a habit of being in God's house ourselves to hear his promises and feast on his sacrament. Heavenly Father, along with that, we also pray that you would grant us a deeper appreciation for the great gift of unity, of being one with each other, forgiving us especially for acting like some of your people are more important than others. That you lead all of us to realize that we have been baptized into one body. That you grant us faith to use the Spirit's gift to love for and to care for one another. Heavenly Father, we pray for the holy ministry because you are the one who has appointed apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and you have sent them out. 
We pray that you would strengthen, guide, and provide for those who preach and teach God's word to us in every place. That he enable all who hear the word to understand it. That we together marvel at the gracious words of God our Savior. As he speaks to us just as he spoke to the people of Nazareth that day. Almighty God, we pray for those who govern our communities and our country. That they be given wisdom and courage to lead with truth and justice. That they follow your will rather than man's whims. And that you grant us all a willingness to support them with our prayers and encouragement as Christian citizens. Almighty Father, we pray for those who are suffering from the calamities of nature and the evils of mankind under the curse of sin. That in your mercy, you would heal those who are injured, comfort those who mourn, bind up those whose hearts are broken, and especially in these days, to shelter those who are homeless and bring aid to all who are in need because of the weather. Almighty Father, we pray that you bring the hope of Jesus to situations that seem hopeless. That you give us hearts that reach out to those around us in love. And that you grant to all those who work to give relief to others courage and danger, skill and difficulty, and compassion in their service. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for we pray. Trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came as the light of the world, so that the world may have light and life through him. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. You pierce the gloomy darkness of sin and unbelief with the brilliant light of your Son. You guided the Magi to worship the Christ and revealed the mystery of your eternal plan to save both Jew and Gentile. You declared Jesus your beloved Son at the Jordan River, and with your Spirit you anointed him to be the Savior of all people. Bless our reception of your Son's body and blood that we may shine with the joy of faith. Use this most holy sacrament to illumine our lives and minds with Christ's forgiveness, peace, and comfort. Refresh our faith and help us to reflect his truth and grace to the world. We ask this that you may receive endless honor, glory, and praise from every tribe and language and people and nation. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
blood of Christ shed for you. The 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 true body and the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you. Keep you in Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. Amen. banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn is number 281 in the hymnal, God has spoken by his promise. 